Okay, we are right on time. Many thanks. So, Andrew with the pistol. Hello, everyone. I was stupid enough to do this from an Amiga 1200, which is great because I don't have a screen in front of me, so I'm going to try and see what I'm doing whilst I'm doing it. Uh, but it'll make sense why later. So I'm here to talk about PyStorm. Uh, my name is Andrew Hutchings. I'm also known as Linux Jedi. Uh, during the day, uh, I work for a nonprofit uh, called uh, the MariaDB Foundation. And by night, I uh, restore uh, Commodore Amigas, um, Acorn computers. I design upgrades for them. And I'm part of the PyStorm community and a whole bunch of other things. I've also written for uh, Pixel Addict, so go buy that, because uh, the next issue has got a big article by me in it. And uh, I'm also going to plug that picture there. was made by uh, Stu Cambridge, who, uh, from Sensible Soccer fame, he did... Um, Cannon fodder and all of that lot. And uh, you can get him to do doodles of you just like that from uh, his uh, site. What's it called now? Design Droid. It's it, Design Droid. So he doesn't know I'm plugging it, but I love his work. So, <laughs> so anyway, about PyStorm. It was a project created by a guy called Claude Schwartz. Um, and if you've ever tried to use a, or upgrade a Commodore Amiga today, you need a processor like a 68030 or a 68060. And if you want a 68060 with a board and RAM and everything like that, you need to sell a kidney, basically. They are really rare, really expensive nowadays. So the idea was to create a very fast budget accelerator. And you can get a lot of compute resources from something called a Raspberry Pi, which you probably all know about. Uh, so what this essentially does is it emulates the uh, 68000 processor on a Raspberry Pi, running Linux originally, um, but the rest of the Amiga motherboard was used, and then it adds things such as RTG. Now, RTG stands for a retargetable, to retargetable graphics. I really can't remember the words out there. Um, and essentially, that means it's like a second graphics card for your Amiga. So, this is what I'm actually projecting from right now is the RTG from my Amiga. It has the native Amiga. If I tried to run an old Amiga game on it, you wouldn't see it on this screen right now because I haven't got the output for it. But I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. It also adds virtual SCSI. So the SD card on there is basically um, a driver for the Pi, the Pi to, uh, the Pi Storm to talk directly to the Raspberry Pi's SD card. So it's rather than being emulated, it's almost like a direct driver in a way. And it also adds RAM. So I've got a Raspberry Pi 4 in here. So nearly 2 gig of RAM added to what is normally a 2 meg system. So a <laughs> little bit of a boost. And everything is open source. The, the boards are open hardware and stuff. What we used to do is uh, a group buy where you could come along and say, I want to buy one of these. And we'd all go to JLC PCB buy a load of boards together, and you just have to solder on the headers, which were great until the chip shortage, and then that kind of died off completely. But back then, I said you can you know, pay more than 20 bucks for a Pi Storm. It was about 18 pounds, um, so probably about 20 odd US dollars, whatever. So it was really, really cheap. You just need a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so this is what the first one looked like. Now, you can see there's quite a few chips to it on top of what is normally a Pi GPIO there. So essentially the problem we have is the Pi GPIO is 40 pins, but you only get about 26 GPIO lines from that. And the Amiga 16-bit Amiga has 16-bit data bus, and then a 24-bit address bus, and then control lines on top of that. It's a lot more than you have IO lines. So what we've got here is a CPLD chip, um, a programmable logic chip, essentially. And we have in there basically the 68000 state machine. And then um, and that does uh, all sorts of multiplexing communications to the Pi. And then uh, we have some buffers, uh, basically because the voltage level translation is needed between uh, the CPLD and the Raspberry Pi. And then the external I.O. logic. So it was nice and simple boards. And so we could get JLC PCB to build all these originally until the CPLD kind of ran out of stock. And then that became difficult. Um, and 
the logic inside that we wrote for the CPLD is enough to run it for an Amiga, but it doesn't include some of the state control lines that uh, other systems used because we were targeting an Amiga 500 at the time. So it, this supports a 500. It supports most of an Amiga 2000, a 1000, and a CDTB. Um, and then, oh, doing this on my clicker, and of course I've got my clicker connected. Uh, <laughs> so I used a Raspberry Pi 3A originally. Um, you could have used the Raspberry Pi 3B, but you'd have to raise the header a bit uh, because otherwise your Ethernet port would smash into the board, um, and that's not good. Uh, you can you can take off the uh, ports on the 3B if you don't want them, or you can extend the header. Um, also, a Pi 02W will work. If you don't know, Pi 02W is basically a Pi 3, but in a much more compressed format. Um, we ran Mishashi 68000, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, 68000 CPU emulator, uh, which it, it was good. It's a, a pretty good 68000 emulator, and then there's some kind of glue code to make it work, but it was basically an off-the-shelf emulator. And most of that software was done by a guy called Bjorn. He's not part of the project anymore, but he did a lot of great early work on it. Oh, again, I'm clicking on my clicker. So, performance-wise, you can see here, uh, this is what's called Sysinfo. It's kind of a stock kind of benchmarking software for an Amiga. And an Amiga 600, which is the same as an Amiga 500, roughly, um, the Pi Storm, original Pi Storm ran about 23 times faster, uh, which is pretty good acceleration. You know, you're getting somewhat, you know, you're getting even faster than uh, what was called 68030, 25 megahertz. Uh, so you're getting about 50 megahertz 030 processor kind of speed out of it, which is pretty good performance for something that costs a lot less than even the CPU for an 030. Uh, how I got into PyStorm, uh, I was designing some new hardware for a Commodore Amiga, and the other advantage of having uh, Mishashi on uh, PyStorm is the fact that you can, on the fly, change the entire configuration of the Amiga. I want to different uh, OS ROM to boot into, different RAM configuration, different hardware configurations. All that can be changed on the fly. Um, I started providing patches, helped build a community. We, this was in this probably September. We had um, 7,000 members on Discord and 3,000 on Facebook. So it's grown to a pretty big community. Uh, so things I've done, I'm going to skip over this, but I did a lot of the early... Uh, work regarding uh, bug fixing and things like that for the uh, uh, original Mashashi Pi Storm. And then we released uh, a version for the Amiga 600 and Amiga 2000. Uh, they are essentially basically the same thing, but the Amiga 2000 has a coprocessor slot, so it's much easier just to bug it in the slot. And then Amiga 600, you have to do this hacky thing where it sits on top of the PLCC CPU. And then uh, there's a little kind of thing in there to tell that CPU to go to sleep. And then that basically is identical after that. So EMU68 come along, came along. Now EMU68 is a bare metal emulator for the uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, for the 68000. So it's much, much faster. You don't have to boot into Linux anymore. This is what this booted from. And it became an option for PyStorm in 2021, and now it's pretty much de facto standard. And it uses JIT-based emulation instead of uh, kind of table-based. So performance-wise, it got a bit faster. <laughs> 1,492 times faster. And this is just on the Amiga 500. <laughs> then the PyStorm 32 came along. This project was scrapped. So essentially, it's the same kind of thing, but for the 32-bit Amigas like this one. Uh, but uh, it became very hard to build, and it required a Pi CM4, which is a Pi without all the ports and everything. You just got these big connectors on the bottom, uh, and it became difficult and expensive to build, so we gave up on that and instead built the Pi Storm 32 Lite, which is light because it doesn't have all the ports on it, but basically it's the same kind of thing. Um, and we have a nice big FPGA on there instead of CPLD. <coughs> FPGA is just much more logic, but... Um, you have to kind of flash it every time you turn it on. Um, and that was a 
basically the start of what became the A1200. This is, this is kind of the peak of PyStorm right now. And we released that about a year ago, um, and it's still going strong. Uh, Performance-wise, we're now talking 3,052 times faster than an Amiga 500, which, yeah, not too bad. Uh, even the Amiga 1200, which this is, is 1,326 times faster. And you can get faster still if you overclock it. I'm not going to overclock mine. I've got a little fan running underneath it as it is. And inside this Amiga, you can see this is what mine looks like inside. So you've got the Pi Storm in here. Um, and then I've got a little cable running out of the HDMI port to the back. And that's what's running this projector right now. And then I 3D printed a kind of assembly with a fan in the net just to keep everything nice and cool. Demo time. So, John Carmack said the Amiga is not powerful enough to run Doom. At the time, to be fair, he was right. Um, the de facto Amiga at the time was kind of Amiga 500, Amiga 600. If you wanted one that could run Doom, it would cost you thousands and thousands, much more than a PC would at the time. But today... Later we were yes. yes. But I can do a bit better. <laughs> Amiquake. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't got sound hooked up, unfortunately, but what I can do, time demo, demo one. It's slow, I know. <laughs> so we've just got to wait for all this demo to finish just to get a nice kind of benchmark out of it. Uh, and there we go. So we get 93 frames a second out of Quake. <laughs> through the RTG. If I ran this through the AGA graphic, the built-in graphics instead, we'd still get about 45 frames a second. So it's a bit faster than native, which would be uh, a few frames a second at best. Oh, and I need to close that window. So common f FAQs. Um, can the PyStorm modify chip RAM? So chip RAM is chipset RAM. It's the RAM that the entire chipset can, the Amiga talks to each other with. So you've got like uh, the audio chip, the graphics chip, etc. cetera. Um, that is capped at two megabytes by design by, by Commodore. They were trying to move it to eight meg for the Amiga 4000, but it never really hit there. Uh, no, it can't because we don't modify the chipset. We don't override the chipset, so we can't increase the RAM that the chipset uses. So whilst we have two gig of fast RAM, we don't have any chip RAM. Um, can you emulate a power PC? Probably you can, but it's going to be a lot of work and we don't want to do it. So if anyone wants to put a PPC emulator in there, it will probably work. Can you use PySorm in other 68,000 based machines? Yes. yes. So um, someone's done a port, uh, forget the name, they've done a port for the Atari. Uh, which basically had to pretty much rewrite the firmware to make it work because Atari actually uses all the 68000s instead of the hacky thing Amiga did. Um, I love Amiga, but Atari did that bit a bit better. And similar problems with the Apple. So there are projects where they're trying to get this running. Um, it's not going, uh, it's not all the way there yet, but um, they're working on it. CD32, uh, CD sorry, 3000 and 4000 versions. In theory, the one in this machine should work on CD32, but it doesn't, and we don't know why yet. We haven't had time to figure it out. Um, it shouldn't take much modification to make it work. 3,000, 4,000 versions are going to require a lot more bus arbitration work, so it's just time to do that. And then the really cool thing we're working on right now is Amiga Native, uh, Amiga Native Video Injection Device, which we haven't got a name for yet. But essentially what it does is it captures the... Dig uh, it sits on in various places in the Amiga, depending on the model, captures the digital video before it gets converted to analog, pipes it through the camera port in the Pi, and then you can have both native video and the RTG video through the HDMI on the Pi. So if you want to sponsor the PyStorm development, uh, Claude has a donate button on his PyStorm32 like GitHub page. Uh, suggest checking it out. Mikhail, who do, uh, develops the EMU68 project, uh, has a Patreon to sponsor the development of it. And if you have any questions at all about the project, feel free to come to me. I'm Linux Jedi everywhere, pretty much. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer them. And that is it. So we have time for questions. Any questions? Yeah. Can you? 
Thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, so according to the SysInfo output, uh, it's not emulating a plain 68,000, but a uh, 030 or 60 or 040? So, um, Mishashi, you can choose which one you want to emulate. Uh, the 020 and 030 are the most stable doing that. For EMU68, it currently pretends it's an 040, but will support the instruction set of an 060. Okay, so that's only about the instructions and it does not emulate the MMU, I guess. Yeah, it's just saying, hey, I'm an 040, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. It will run 060 code fine. Hi, um, Hi, I'm actually Debian's M68K maintainer, and I'm wondering um, if, you're, if there's plans to add MMU support so you can boot the Linux kernel. Are there plans to add MMU? Uh, that is a good question. Mushashi, no. We did have it to begin with, and it was broken, so we didn't. Um, EMU68, I believe, uh, somewhat supports MMU, but needs some work to support it properly, if you know what I mean. It's, at the moment, it's a direct one. It's basically given a, a block of RAM in the Pi and just said, here, yeah, just use that. So we, need, we could probably emulate MMU without too much trouble there. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, just a quick question about the MU68 variant. Yep. Um, do, you, uh, is that, it's, well, do you need to maintain some, a, a second OS on the SD card with that, or is it effectively a persistent yep. thing once it's on? No, it's a system that boots on its by itself uh, completely. Um, there's a whole set of tools the Raspberry Pi Foundation give you to, to create your own bare metal OS, essentially. So it's, it's an OS in its own right. The, hard, the downside of that is every part of hardware, we have to write new drivers from scratch to be able to talk to the hardware, which is why if you want to use Ethernet or Wi-Fi or anything like that, it becomes a much harder task for us to do that on EMU68, and that isn't there yet. So there's no USB host support. You can't use USB keyboard. I'm sorry, say that again? There's no USB host support for the Pi? Not on EMU68, right. no. There Economy is a Mishashi that will actually support uh, keyboard and mouse through, uh, right. through okay. the Pi's uh, USB, yeah. Still time for one or two quick questions? Yeah. One, at the back. one in the back. Hi, uh, quick one, I think. Um, yeah. Did you have to do anything special to cope with the bring up time of the Pi, because it's a lot, a lot slower than the CPU? Uh, that's a really good question, uh, the bring up time for the Pi. So the CPLD versions hold down the reset until the Pi is booted. So basically, the machine's basically in a, I'm resetting constantly kind of thing. The uh, version in this, the Pi Storm 32, it will boot the native CPU first, because we, the FPGA hasn't been flashed. Once the FPGA is flashed, then the reset gets held down. Um, and it's a very short time. You're talking like two or three seconds. Still time for one question? Last uh, one. Yeah. Okay, that will be the last one. So I guess the problem with the CPLD version is that AMD has announced that they're going to stop making those. Uh, so AMD, oh, the Xilinx. Yes, well, now, Xilinx is AMD, right? Yeah, no, they announced like using, the last buys or something. From we're that. not using Xilinx one, so I ah. uh, no. So we're okay. using um, the CPLD is Altera Max uh, Max Two. Yeah. Oh, so it's Intel. And then <laughs> okay. the FPGA is uh, Trion, maybe uh, Fnix, Fnix Trion. Ah, okay. Maybe I took a, I thought I saw Xilinx in the first picture, but maybe that's wrong. Or yeah. Maybe that's a prototype. The other projects I maintain, yes, they are all screwed in regards to Xilinx, but... <laughs> Good. That's it. Many, many thanks, uh, Andrew. No problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>